Hey, what's up, guys? It's your host, Deacon Yanga. It's another Fight of KC show. And today I have um, two tremendous leaders in KC, two powerhouses of KC. And I'm excited and humbled to have them on my show today. Um, it's about to get heated up in here. So you guys are not even ready for this. So um, I want to make welcome my first guest, who is the author of Million Dollar Bedroom. He is also the CEO and co-founder of Full Scale. And he is the host on the the the, the most acclaimed podcast in Kansas City, the Sada Puzzle, and he's also the, the CEO and founder of Bigger Book. Make welcome, Matt DeCarsi. Zeke, what's up? <laughs> you got to come in with a Sada Puzzle. What's up? What's up? I like that one. Well, hey, that. Hey, hey. That that would be, and we're back for and another episode back. of Fire <laughs> Fired Up KC. Woo! There you go. How about that? Awesome. Now our second guest today is man. He's an awesome speaker. He's the author of Get Real Culture. Oh man, he's just an outstanding speaker in KC, well known around KC. Mick, welcome, Mister Harry Campbell in the house. Make some noise for Harry Campbell. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Woo! Let's I don't go. think I can yell as loud as Matt can. That was pretty sweet. Nice shot, man. <laughs> straight out, straight out of Ric Flair's playbook on that one, baby. Oh, oh man, he was like an eleven-time <laughs> NWA World Champion. I mean, he was the Nature Boy. Uh, Ric Flair was awesome, man. Um, an honor again to be here with two legends. Every time I start this show, I always tell myself, "Mama, I made it," because I'm always needing some awesome leaders. So, an honor again to be here. So, um, before let's get right into it. Um. Matt DeCarcy, just give us a little bit bio about yourself and let people know who we have, we have here today. Well, you, you, you laid a lot of stuff out there. Um, it, it, the short version is I'm an entrepreneur, an author, a podcast host, <laughs> and a parent. Um, I, but I've done a lot of different things, Zeke. And once again, man, thanks for having me on. I, there is something about your energy that just gets me so excited. So <laughs> I, I'm fired up about it. And uh, you, you were recently on the Start a Puzzle podcast, yes. which is, is uh, how a lot of people might know me. I'm also the CEO and founder of Full Scale we do tech services uh, and also do a, a fair amount of investment so we've made over a million dollars in uh, investments in uh, Kansas City based startups in the last year woo, um, and yeah that's a woo for sure um, <laughs> you mentioned Gigabook Gigabook's one of the many things that I do but I'm involved in a lot of different software platforms and have published three books so um, yeah uh, and when and then I'll sleep at mm. some point in my life, but not not much of that's occurred on the way to getting all that stuff uh, on my yeah. resume. How old are your kids? The three and a half and five and a half. Oh wow, yeah. you're in the busy stage too. Yeah, yeah. Those, my, those are the best stage, <laughs> the fun stage. That's the be that's the best startup that I founded. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Harry, just give us a bio about this and let people know who we have here today. Sure. Um, wow. Out of uh, school, I spent seven years in marketing at Procter & Gamble, which is an awesome place to be from. Um, working there is um, uh, extraordinarily challenging in a good way, but uh, it's a great place to be from. Uh, included in my seven years there, um, I moved to Northwest Arkansas, and I was one of the founding members of the Walmart customer team, and that was where I, I got a chance to spend quite a bit of time around Sam Walton. And that, and the reason I specifically point that out is he changed my life. He was amazing um, as a leader and a communicator. And, and uh, by the way, when I was around him, he was the richest man in the world. So we'll put successful on his uh, scorecard too. Um, in 1992, so seven years out of school after PNG, I came to Kansas City. So I've been in Kansas City for damn 28 years. Wow. That's uh, longer than y'all have been alive. Um, no, and, not me, not, not me, man. Not I'm, Matt, old. Me. I'm old. Not Matt. I'm old. No, not yeah. Matt. That's, you're talking to me now. And, and I've had an interesting, eclectic career that I didn't plan on and uh, not sure that I would wish it on anybody else, but it worked. I spent uh, a bunch of years at Sprint, and then um, I left there to be the co-owner of a sports marketing firm, which happened to win the Mr. K Award in 1998, which was um, probably my uh, most fun and proud uh, accomplishment in the business world. I then sold half of that and got into the uh, dot-com world of 99. And uh, how'd that work out for you, Harry? Not well. Um, the company did not make it. Um, so I found myself jobless. So between 35 and 40, those two ages, I spent this weird time away from the corporate world, running a successful small business, and then 
trying to do a startup in the dot-com world back in uh, the Clinton era. Um, the best thing about the experiences I had that were um, non-corporate were that when I went back to corporate, I went back to Sprint, um, I was a different person. You get humbled and you get humiliated enough. Um, you either change or you die, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up having some big jobs at Sprint um, and uh, then spun to Embark. Dan Hesse was my boss for four or five years. I was a president of the consumer markets at Embark. And um, I loved it. Then when Embark was sold, um, in the last 11 years, I've had a very eclectic uh, life. I did um, run Dury Vision for about five years, but mainly what I've been doing is investing, which I, that's why I was clapping for Matt and what he has done to the community. Um, philanthropy, um, speaking. I have three books also in the Get Real series. And um, uh, just basically trying to make a difference in this community. I'm, I'm not a Kansas Cityan by birth, but 28 years here, it's sunk in deep and I'm fired up about being here. Mm. Wow, that's, that's an awesome bio. Um, I don't, I can't imagine what it, it would feel like to be around the owner of Walmart. That would be like an, a whole a mind blown experience just to learn from, you know, the, the master himself. Um, yeah, uh -huh. actually, let me make, can I make two points about that? Yeah. One was fascinating. Um, my wife was involved in a, a, a charity groundbreaking thing that Sam's wife was involved in. And so I went to a number of things that he and I leaned against the wall and had nothing to do with what was going on. Mm -hmm. And he remembered my name. He remembered my story. He asked me very pointed questions. And I thought, wow, this guy, you know, he had a million employees or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, richest man in the world. And he cared. That was one thing that struck with me and stuck with me. And the other thing was that um, he, he set me free. He didn't change the way I treat people, but I worried that I was a bit too nice. I'm a people pleaser from um, an alcoholic family. Mm. And I was worried I was too nice. He was the nicest guy I've ever met. Now, he would fire you in private if he needed to. He'd give you direct criticism and feedback when necessary and you deserved it. But he was so nice. His organization loved him and um, wanted him to succeed and to, to work for him. And so he set me free to, to operate the way I knew my personality would mm. and showed me the way. And I will never, ever forget that with regard to him. Yeah, I think that, that goes along with that. John Master always says that like, it's always good to remember people's names and stories. You know, it means a lot. Uh, they say, what is something that someone is most interested in themselves? You know, if you can get that, you get their heart. Um, Mr. Matt, I want to ask you this because you do a lot in the community. You are one of the top leaders in Kansas City and with your um, podcast, Startup Podcast, which is one of the top 100 in, on Apple, you know, what is your why in doing all you do and how do you discover your why? Yeah, that's a good question because sometimes I, the why can be because it feels like it's what you should do. Mm. Um, you know, <laughs> we, it, it, and, and you talk about all the different things that you do. Sometimes I, as an entrepreneur, you do them and you're guided by a, some, something's pulling you. And mm -hmm. uh, when it, and, and, you know, Matt Watson, my, my often co-host on Startup Hustle, we started the podcast because we wanted to, we wanted an outlet to complain about being entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning like it, it's, it's such a misunderstood lifestyle and reality. Mm -hmm. um, now with that, our goal, our, really our goal, and, and you talk about the things in the community. I, I am a firm and true believer that if you help other people get what you want, then you usually end up getting what you want. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, you have to approach many of these things with a selfless attitude. So like we, with, starting startup hustle we had that we felt like we wanted to share a lot of things that help people avoid uh, some of the mistakes that we had made now as an investor um that was a win-win because we use a lot the investments that we made weren't were, none of them were with cash they were with services and they were so at a business like full scale where we have 200 employees and they're programmers at any given time we have several that are not necessarily uh, they're, well, not, they're not working for, directly with a client. So you have this excess capacity of resources. And I think in any time, you, and all businesses have them, all businesses have excess capacity. So the question is, is what can you do to hang up wins? Mm. So rather than, you know, we have some things that Matt and I own, but we, when we could get behind really uh, dynamic people like Roy Scott at Healthy Hip Hop, who... Uh, 
uh, two years later and, and uh, close to $400,000 of support has now has graduated through Techstars Atlanta, mm. is raising money at a different step. And he, now he's doing things that really are meaningful and matter. Um, I think really in the end, the why is like, um, I mean, some of it is, is just like, well, what else do I have to do, man? Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. if I can wake up and do what I'm passionate about it, man, I love talking about, uh, I'm obsessed with business. So mm -hmm. if I get to do things that are fun and meaningful around that, then I feel really good. You know, Harry mentioned something about being set free at Walmart and, you know, with Sam Walton is like, so some of my why is also being it's setting maybe setting others free yeah. and and feeling the same thing with myself now harry i have a question for you did you also through those years did you get to work with bob bernstein um i didn't i know bob and his son uh steven um and i've known a couple of people that have worked there as senior execs um i know all about the happy meal and um yeah. the crazy success that bob had there I mean, they were a long time ad agency for walmart weren't they yeah, and so and you know Bob Bernstein's one of Kansas City's treasures, and a lot of people uh, may not know the name. The dude invented the Happy Meal, mm. and a bunch of other things. Really, at, well, as one of the greatest marketers you'll ever find, he's the founder of Beauty Brands, and he tells such an amazing story about uh, about joining the Walmart team before they were the Walmart that we knew, and mm -hmm. just build help building that brand, and it was really cool. That, and he felt the same way about Walton, like. Uh, you know, like, uh, it's important to get behind people that you can set free and let them do what they do, but also not, you know, he would also say that, that was, he'd tug you to the side and be like, hey, man, what, what the frick are we doing here? So, yeah, the, the why is, is it constantly being defined, Zeke? So that was the, the short answer. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. Um, Harry, what is your why behind what you do and being able to be in the industry for over 28 years? Um, love the question because uh, anybody that hasn't seen Simon Sinek on his TED talk about the why, mm. get their ass on their computer and look at it. I, it's probably been viewed 50 million times now, or mm -hmm. I might be understating it. Um, uh, he and Brene Brown are my favorites uh, in terms of the high volume viewership. Wow. Um, my why is very simple. Um, I, I'm wired to give back and um, I love it. I do it. I did it while I was working and that made it so that it was a great culture that people wanted to work in. I've done it now in Kansas City um, and I'm doing it uh, as investments. I've got, uh, I guess, four companies that we're invested in and or pretty significant owners in um, as a result of our um, uh, choices that we've made of my, uh, me and my family, my wife and I. And the... Um, cool thing about it is that we are not entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that time and time again. I am an extrovert. I spit, I wave, I tell crazy stories, but that's not entrepreneurism. Entrepreneurism to me is um, defined more by your risk factor and the choices you make uh, with regard to how you earn your money. I love being around entrepreneurs. I love investing in them and mentoring them. And I do a lot of that through the hemp program. I, I just can't tell you how much I love it, but it is not my gig. And so I have invested in and cheered on people, but it's not what I do. And I'm always, um, I get a lot of energy by being around people like Matt. There are self um, proclaimed entrepreneurs because um, I kind of wish I was, and it kind of sucks that I'm not. Mm, mm, mm. Now, Harry, you are in your book, you uh, get real. It's a really, it, it, it gives a reality of what it means to be walk on and get successful because in our day and age, there's this mindset of, I have this big vision and I'm just going to dream about it and not do anything about it. Now, uh, Harry, talk to us about getting real. Um, cause I, I've watched a lot of this. <laughs> talk to us about getting real. Well, the first thing I want to say is I do have three books and I double spaced them to get into a hundred pages. Okay. So, <laughs> um, if you take more than an hour and 15 minutes to read my book, you need to go back to school, bro. <laughs> it's just not good. Um, I am serious. You look at them, you're like, wow, they're simple. But I, I, the way I approach life and business is simplicity. Um, I'm going to narrow down your question into one, the, the book that I just released called Get Real Mindset. Mm -hmm. The entire book is on three simple principles about how I think you can have the right mindset in order to be wildly successful the way you want to in the long term. And the three principles are being an attractor, 
and I could give you a long explanation. I'm going to simply say, be somebody that people want to be around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, the opposite of that is those repellers, even if they're good at your job, if you're a repeller, people don't want to be around you. They're yeah. like, you know, go on the corner, produce your results and then throw them over here, but don't be <laughs> around you. The second one is embrace the crookedness of life. The plan is not going to happen. You need to plan, but it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you might get in a car wreck on your, way to a meet, on your way to a meeting with a customer. Um, you, you may uh, break your arm. I don't know what's going to happen, but you better be able to embrace it. And how you react to change is way more important than mm -hmm. um, uh, the plan that you have. So embrace the crookedness of life. It's not an integrity statement. It's a crooked, mm -hmm. uh, like a dog's hind leg is the way the world works. And the third one is live to learn, absorb, pay attention, watch things that don't have anything to do with you. Ask why, ask why, ask why. So those mm -hmm. are my three points, being a tracker, embrace crookedness and live to learn. And I, I really believe I wrote this book to try to talk to my kids who are 26, 23 and 12 about how to be successful in life. Mm -hmm. Let me, you just, you just blew my mind there because um, I don't know where I saw this. I saw this and they say that when, like in, in a yearbook, the student that smiles at the yearbook has more chance of being successful in the future. You know, I don't know where I saw that, but it's like people who are easier to re relate with become more successful because people can work with them. So I think that's a key factor. Um, Matt, with your book, um, Million Dollar Bedroom, I think more of million dollar rooms. And why I say that is, there are some rooms you enter into and everyone in there is smart and millionaires. Tell us about your concept about million dollar bedrooms. But million dollar bedrooms is the story of, of my entrepreneurial journey. So I, in 2009, I started a, uh, a business that I referred to as my accidental business because I wasn't really even trying to start it, which by the way, my best businesses, and I've got three that qualify, have all been accidents. Like they, you, because as an entrepreneur, you need to be looking for opportunity and, and, and just wherever it is. And you don't know when it's going to come. And I will, you talk about the crookedness of life. You're guaranteed to have your best opportunities and your best everything when you are in the worst possible situation to start the business. Like mm. in 2009, I had gone through a divorce. I had gone through the housing bubble and I went back to school as an adult. And when I mentioned, I went to, I, to the Kelly School of Business, which, you know, that's where Harry went and I had this great opportunity but and so here I am a year and a half into it and I had no money man I it was gone and I was just looking for a hustle but I started a, a business in the extra bedroom of my home which became that million dollar bedroom mm. um, we figured it that whole book is about trying to be really kind of about being scrappy so mm. um, I funded that business with a stack of credit cards that my poker buddies contributed <laughs> um, and ended so, and that whole business started with, I had no, if I had to go back and advise myself on whether or not to start that business, I would have literally told myself, run, dude, run. This is the worst mm -hmm. idea I've ever heard, but I didn't know any better. So I, I kept moving forward, but within, uh, so I had an eight, a credit card with an $8,000 limit. And, uh, over the next eight years, turned that into $30 million of revenue. And now still every bit of what full scale and my other businesses, like some of the same people work at the, our COO at full scale was our intern in the million dollar bedroom. Wow. So, so many, th everything that I have done has had this interconnected nature. Now, the funny part is, is when I finished million dollar bedroom and Harry will confirm this, the only good part about writing a book is finishing it. Mm -hmm. Um, it's God, it's just, you will hate your own book by the time it comes out. You are, I mean, you are over it, but you know, so when I finished it, I finished it. So I've, I was, you talk about the getting around good people. Um, the editor of all three of my books is a guy named Patrick Price, who has been the editor of a dozen New York times bestsellers. And he's also known as the guy that discovered the franchise. He's just not that into you, uh, which was a huge everything. Um, now, that had been turned down by 20 different publishers before he found it and it became a $400 million enterprise. But when we were done, I told Patrick and I had published another book four months prior to that. I said, Patrick, I'm ready to publish this, but I almost want to put you on retainer because I know that this is really just the beginning of the story. We were working on a series here, but you know, we made a lot of really dumb mistakes and I much like with startup hustle, I wanted to just, I, it, if you okay, you mentioned reading, you reading your book quickly. 
uh, the one feedback I got from the book is other than it holds up my, my, uh, my wobbly table really well, um, is, is that it read quickly. And mm. I, so I tell the story of what we did, but the thing is, I tell you in the beginning, I'm like, I can't give you a blueprint because, because things change and yeah. you wouldn't want my blueprint anyway, because it's already used. It's been done. There are things you can learn. So I stop and very quickly <laughs> explain the why. Uh, of different things. And it's really intended to be kind of like a basic entry level walkthrough of not doing all the dumb stuff that we did. And we did a lot of it. So and learning from that, and it just that's you'd say the why is I love helping people avoid errors. And if and that literally is the definition of life changing. So if you can I, help I have people a question avoid for errors, you, you can help them but yeah. Sure. I have a question. Uh, back to the poker, the guys from the poker game. Did you beat them and they had to give you their credit cards or did they loan you money on their credit cards? Because so, I kind of well, like that. So that, that business was, so we were, we became one of the uh, top 20 ticket brokers in the country. And for the last four years of that business, we're in StubHub's top 20 concert ticket resellers. Mm. So the thing is, is you can't fund a business like that. So I didn't, and you know, like I just didn't have a whole lot going on, but I, and I talk about this in the book as we, uh, so my friends were super fascinated with it. They compared me to Kramer on Seinfeld when he opened Kramerica, especially, and they, and they were like, you should get an intern. So I did, you know, it's like, it, okay, why not? But as they saw us uh, doing well, they wanted the points. Mm -hmm. So you talk about the why, if you can figure out what other people want, they're like, oh shit, I'm getting like, we, I had my, some of my friends uh, were getting twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 worth of points a year by the time we were done because I, I, we continued to use their cards to buy stuff and I left them in, uh, in the situation. So yeah, I mean, just like weird stuff. That, that business was not, meant to succeed and it's the it is literally the foundation of everything i do today so yeah mm, 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 man um another thing that i'm i'm really passionate about and i think it's important for young people to understand is this the passing down of a torch right the passing down of wisdom because if you've seen someone who have done it you believe you can do it too um, in that in that regard, Harry, um, being told with your experience, what are some tidbits of knowledge and wisdom you want to give to yourself at my age or someone out there trying to hustle who is a younger person? Wow. Um, the uh, probably the single most important thing I would say I asked I got asked this the other day on a podcast. What's my superpower? And I kind of laughed. I'm like, well, that's a hell of a question. Um, <laughs> And I said very simply, it's creating a culture where people want to desperately work. Such a positive, uh, productive culture that people desperately want to work there. And I use those words very specifically because if people desperately want to work with you, um, good things happen. If you have an opening, 11 people are standing outside the door and you can pick the best of the 11. It gives you all sorts of, it affords you opportunities. And if you do that inside a big company, by the way, you're such a differentiator, it's ridiculous because big companies don't do that, they don't care. If you're an entrepreneur like Matt and, you're, and you understand that, you're on your second or third go around, you get it. You have to get the get best people. You can't make mistakes because a mistake in hiring can blow you out of the water. Mm -hmm. Whereas at a big company, you can get away with it. And so the, the simplest thing I would say is create an environment that people desperately want to be involved with, they want to win with, and they want to make them and you successful. And if you can do that, you win. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm in the hemp uh, entrepreneur program and the company that I um, mentor, uh, Dan Holmgren specifically is the owner, it's uh, Image Makers and it's in Wamigo, Kansas. It was supposed to be in Kansas City. They did the bait and switch on me, man. It's like an hour and a half west. Of, it's a suburb of Manhattan, Kansas. I love the, you know what we do? I love the mentoring. Once a week, Dan and I get on the phone and we sometimes talk about life. Sometimes it's about kids. If he has issues or problems with the business, he brings it to me. And um, I'm 58 years old, guys. I've probably seen it before. I don't know if I've dealt with it well, but I can tell you I've seen it before. So having that ability to have that kind of discussion is fun for me. And I do a lot of other mentoring informally outside of that because it is fun to share your stories, your successes and your failures with people so they can do better. Mm, mm, 
but by the way, this is a great question. And so there's, all right, I refer to this as knowledge transfer and mm -hmm. I find yeah. something to be remarkably powerful <laughs> about it. Now it depends on what kind. So first off, I mentioned before helping people avoid errors that you have made is can be is literally can be classified as life changing for people. Mm -hmm. But as an entrepreneur, one thing I learned very early and is that there were a lot of people that took interest in me that were older than me. And I, you know, at the t I didn't know why, maybe they saw part of me in them, or maybe they just liked helping. Now you mentioned uh, uh, it, uh, the hemp programs, the Hellsberg Ent Entrepreneurial Mentoring Program. So you have to know Laryl Holt. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. So L Laryl was in my book, Balance Me, and his someone that, that like a, along the way of the publishing, like literally went out of his way. And I, I've helped, uh, you know, help return that favor to Laryl when he created the recent program that he launched through hemp. And, um, you know, so you get, you find, if you can find people that will take an interest in you, you're stupid to not let them do it. But here's the thing. Knowledge is not meant to be held. It wasn't, it wasn't that person's and it is not yours. It is meant to be transferred and moved along. So mm -hmm. I seek different types of it. So I have been, I have, I have the most interesting collection of knowledge transfer people. Uh, Cause I look for people that are exceptional and I like to study like, what is it about? So I'm fascinated with rock stars. I worked in the music industry for 10 years before I did tickets, almost 10 years. Wow. And with that, I've met a lot of interesting people. So I find, I, I love the, the rock star because the rock star has to turn inspiration on at a given time on stage in front of a lot of people in a high pressure situation. And it, I, I, that's difficult for me. So like for me, I find, if I find a moment of inspiration, I tell my wife that I'll, I'll come back out of the room that I'm in right now when that horse is no longer carrying me forward. Mm. But, but the thing is, is I don't ever know when it's going to come. So mm -hmm. I have to capitalize on it. So the ability to like turn it on at a given moment is it fascinates me. Now, if, if, the one thing that, that I, I think is, is great is if you can find people like that that are equally. So at first I was insecure about finding people because like, why would this person be interested in me? I found that, that a lot of people that weren't entrepreneurs, but were these ridiculously high performers were more fascinated with me than I was with them which creates a really interesting, um, if you can start to have this like, it, and here's the thing is there's one key that I've learned. It ha the knowledge transfer has to occur without any expectation of return. Like you can't, and, and so hemp is a good example because you mentioned image makers and Wamigo does have like a population of 400. I've been there. Um, I know the guy, actually, I know the guy that owns the, the bank in Wamigo. Uh, yeah. So, so, but the thing is, is, is you talk about no, no expectation of return. Uh, so like in the hemp program, you're not allowed to do business with your mentee. And there's a reason for that. And that's because you can't, there can't be an expectation of return. So mm -hmm. if you can get some of that stuff going, it becomes remarkably powerful. And the, now it's not always about the conversation. It's about that after effect. It's about that part of your mind that you opened up or the, so I, I mentioned like a rock star. One of them is a guy named Jake Sinninger, who's easily like one of the top 50 guitarists in the world. Mm -hmm. And I talked to him and we literally have, we have conversations about like, okay, the last one was about how do you, how do you obtain guru status? And we're talking about the things that bother us that are getting in the way of us getting to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. And he's like, dude, I don't carry my gear in and out of the venue. It's not because I'm not willing to, it's because it's not what I'm here to do. I'm doing the best thing possible by focusing on this and different stuff. So like you will find some weird stuff. Like if you ask Jake how, how many guitar chords they are, he'll say, oh, there's 7,334. How many do you know? Well, Matt, I know all of them, you know? And it's like, but the, it, it, here's the thing. Are, are you a master of what you do like that? Cause mm -hmm. if you don't know them, he doesn't, he doesn't only know all of them. He can give them to you backwards. Mm. So, but the, here's the thing though, is, is he has a lot of talent, but when you see the level of, of desire to practice and perfect that, like you can't, if you leave that conversation going, if, okay, I literally dr drove home later that night and I was just think I couldn't get out of my head about, I was like, God, I got a whole lot of work to do. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so it, 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 you can find it to be inspiring, but I think that knowledge transfers key, which by the way, Zeke is why I love you, my friend, because <laughs> you want, you want the knowledge and you want to pass it along and you're not doing this for any, 
the expectation to return. Like it's very pure. And I love that mm -hmm. because it, I don't know when you're going to get what you want, but you will, you will, if you keep it up, mm -hmm. you will if you keep it up. You know, guys, um, when I do a keynote speech, I always do my own bio because nobody can make fun of you like you can. So I do that at my own bio. And the last slide I show before I go into my material for my book is a page called Mentors and Influencers. And it's just a page of names in different colors and different font sizes, including Sam Walton, et cetera. And it's called Mentors and Influencers. And the reason why you had to put influencers up there is uh, there's a few people on that wall that I hate, but they also influence you and should make a difference because there's a couple of cheaters that went to jail. And if that doesn't influence how you uh, think about uh, doing things correctly. And I love that. And, and when I do that, inevitably, it, it sparks such a conversation with people about why is um, you know, uh, Mindy Corcoran on your list and she happened to lose her um, father and her son in the shooting out here at the Jewish Community Center about five years ago or six years ago and the grace that she's handled that with and how she said changed the course of her life as a result of that that matters to me mm -hmm. and everybody needs to think about what their list looks like and if you're Zeke's age the list might be six or eight people but as you accumulate them you think purposefully doing things differently or as a result of what you're taught is very cool mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, all the all these people from different walks of life, and I've been doing this for a decade. Like tr the, my my collection of of influence, mm -hmm. um, they it every single person. It success demands payment in advance. I have yet to prove a single instance because people are like, oh, that person's so talented. That person probably practiced more than you've been awake in the last mm -hmm. three years or something. There's really no accidents about it. Some people do have the people that have the most quote talent are the are the ones that are most interested in perfecting it. So you know, like that, here's the thing. There's no shortcuts, man. I have really yet to find it. Uh, I have not proved the success demanding payment and advance thing wrong yet. Mm. Well, one, one of the things in, in Get Real Mindset that I talk about is I believe that life is won and lost at the margin. And, and that means that there are some things you're great at and some things you're horrible at, but there really isn't a huge number of either of those. Mm. Everything is played between, you know, the 40s. And that goes back to your idea. If you're willing to put the work in and the practice, what happens is if it's going to be a toss up and you've done that, you win the toss ups. And you, if you win nine out of 10 toss ups, guess what? They're no longer toss ups anymore. Yep. You're winning. Mm -hmm. and, and I think people need to understand that there's so much clustered in that middle and it isn't just luck. And they look at a pawn with envy, somebody that gets this meeting that they were trying to get. I'm like, they, they, they worked it very hard. And in fact, if you trail it backwards, you're going to find that they were doing things you weren't willing to commit to do in order to get what they got. Mm -hmm. well, the, the, higher, the higher you climb on that, so people are like, oh, I want to be in the top 1% of what I do. Well, that means that you're not, you're, you're <laughs> behind, 99% of the people are behind you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when your, your graph doesn't look as much like a hockey stick, when you're competing with people that are at your level, and that's why you said like that, that the, the, the devil's in the detail. Uh, it's about those margins. And it's about like, are you ready to work harder, smarter or whatever? I do not believe in luck, guys. Like that is preparation and opportunity mm -hmm. uh, crossing paths. People are like, well, what about the person that won the lottery ticket? Yeah, they prepared by going and buying the ticket. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to win the lottery tonight, guys, because I'm not prepared. I didn't buy a ticket. So, <laughs> I, I mean, there's – it's – it's true, but yeah. it's true. Like I'm telling you the most successful people I've ever met are okay. Then I mentioned that conversation with my friend, Jake. Then the, the, the next conversation we had the next time I saw him was what's the difference between being a genius and being crazy. Mm. Cause, and, and by the way, the best answer I found for that yet is who cares? Cause it, 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 no, it's a one, it is a 100% external observation. Mm. But guess what? Anyone that, it, the, and the real difference is, is if you've done something that people think is notable, then you become a genius, but you were probably really freaking crazy on your way there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is it. And like, what's yeah. the difference between being obsessed and being driven? Like, that's mm -hmm. it. I, I don't find a lot of people in that very top notch of anything that aren't like, if you, uh, okay, so you say, Jake, how, how, how long, how much time do you spend playing guitar every day? He'll be like, I don't know, 12 hours. How much time do you spend thinking about playing guitar? And he'll go, all of it. 
Mm, wow. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Like, I mean, it's, yeah, but, but here's the thing on the flip side of that, and this is where it's <laughs> interesting. It, so I have that same issue. I can't quit thinking about business. I actually wish I could because it gets noisy. It, it's like almost like the definition of insanity. Like you like, come on, stop, stop, stop. And you know, so it's, it's like, it's a really challenging thing. And like the, it, by the way, the other people that have the same freaking problem, they're like, I wish I could quit pl- thinking about this all the time, but I can't. You know how I handle that? This is the weirdest thing. My wife is laughing somewhere now. Um, I read, I read uh, fiction books, mainly about serial killers. So think Dexter in a book. <laughs> And it's the only thing that I could do to shut my mind down from the next steps and, and what, what we're doing and, and where we're going and who I'm doing, what to do and what tomorrow looks like. And what, okay, I got to get up at 645 and then, 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 it was the only way to shut my mind down. So I, I read about serial killers, mm-hmm. not right. real life ones necessarily, but it, it, you know, it, <laughs> it get, it, it's my escape. It is. It's the only way I could shut it down. Mm-hmm. I, I had a lot of questions, but I, you guys covered a whole bunch of things I wanted to ask. <laughs> oh, man. So this is an awesome conversation. I'm just Dude, like, you, I'm just... You, should, you shouldn't sign up two public speakers and people <laughs> like this. Like, is, is Zeke still – are you here, Zeke? Are you, like, I'm here. I'm, just I, I'm, sorry we, I'm sorry we didn't let you talk, man. I'm sorry. No, I'm just listening. I was like, this is perfect. This is what I love to do. That's a thing, too. Like, I love listening so much. Um, um, let me ask this. Uh, uh, so – I want to be, if I, I want to become like, you know what, I think it's already put, put a stamp on this where it's like, you know, whatever you want to become, you want to spend time in doing that, which is, I spoke to a coach of a basketball team this morning and he said, it takes what it takes to get to where you want. It just takes what it takes. It takes that work. Um, I want to ask you guys real briefly, what was your, most of your time spent when you were starting versus what, where you are now? What was most of the time spent doing when you were starting out? What was the hardest thing for you to accomplish versus where you are now? I, can I go first? Because yeah, I'm ready, man. So uh, first off, most people fail at the start. Like they never mm-hmm. try. Mm-hmm. So if you don't take a shot at it, you're never going to get it. <laughs> now, all right. So I've, I've dropped out of five colleges on my way to being a junior. Mm-hmm. You talked about the high school yearbook <laughs> earlier. I got voted most likely to live at home the rest of my life. I was not a good student. Like I do not profile well for executives. Now I, but here's the thing for a while, I believed that I wasn't going to be successful. I, I, so I had to first start by believing it. And then I just quit caring. Like I quit caring what everybody else thought or the way that they were going to pigeonhole me right now. I didn't graduate from college and that made it harder for me to get a job when I was 25. Mm. And then I learned how to create value. I learned how to sell. Uh, and then I quickly learned that if you can sell, no one cares what your background is, as long as you're not like a criminal. And then I, the next thing you know, I'm working in the, like I mentioned working in the music industry, and I got a job working for Roland, the world's largest maker of electronic musical instruments. I applied and made it through that entire hiring process where it very specifically says, do not apply if you do not have an MBA. Mm-hmm. I just didn't care. I didn't mm-hmm. care. Like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? They're going to tell me no. Wow. So by creating value and, and, and by the way, selling, nothing occurs at a business until something is sold. Mm. So if you don't think the salespeople are the most important part of your business, you might be wrong. Because if they stop selling or they suck at it, how are you going to have everyone pay everyone else that's there? So, I mean, I, and then dude, here's the thing is like, we're in a golden age of information. Like for me, we didn't have podcasts when I was getting started. So it was books on tape mm. and I just absorbed, absorbed, absorbed. I made, I became obsessed about either becoming a genius or being crazy or one of them. Like, I mean, it just, but dude, just don't let it look, try it try it. I, I hate it when people say it's not the right time. I'm not mm. ready. I'm like, mm. okay, you're never going to be like yeah. that crooked, that crooked life concept. Dude, I literally started the business that became the seeds of everything I do now at the worst time possible in my life. Mm. And it, you know, I, I, there, I be, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Nothing was going to stop me, you know? So sometimes you just got to, you know, take a shot. Believe in yourself. I mean, that's the key. Wow. wow. Harry. I got, a, 
I gotta follow that. Gee, <laughs> I, I cut that. I cut that short, man. I was like, in my head, I was like, stop talking, because I could go on on that forever. Um, the question specifically had to do with when when you're starting out, what do you do? And I kind of clumped them into a couple different things. One of them has to do with um, be curious, ask questions, because you're in the learning phase. The most important thing to remember is you know nothing. And to admit that, you, you can internally believe that you know more than you're letting on. But at the end of the day, one of the, the, the best ways to have people try to help you is to um, ask questions and ask for their advice. So that's a huge part of my answer. The second part has to do with helping. Um, if you're wound to help, it's amazing. And helping, actually, selling is helping. If you're really trying to press selling, you're not going to be successful in the long term. What you're doing is you're trying to help somebody solve a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the best salespeople in the world are solving a problem for somebody by helping. And um, I laugh because uh, Matt and I got some overlap, even though he's got the entrepreneur thing going. The perseverance is true. I am um, so amazingly mediocre at everything I do sports-wise. I know the rules. I could be a coach. I don't have – no. it's just not going to happen, okay? But – I never quit. And so I always joke, if you want to play me, you got to bring two changes of clothes because you're going to be here three days. And then eventually you're going to say, I got to go home. And I'm going to say, I win. I just won. <laughs> and the margins, that's the margins, man. <laughs> it is because it, it, I call it perseverance or whatever you want to talk about. And it's one of the reasons why I became a cross country and track runner. And I ran at Vanderbilt is I wanted desperately to be good at something that, because I love sports, but I couldn't, I didn't have the, uh, the physical ability, but cross country running, 10,000 meters, all you had to do was just keep going. And I could keep going, and I'd run the same speed for 100 meters as I did for 10,000 meters. So I set the school record at Vanderbilt for, for 10K, and it stood for 35 years. Wow. Because I just keep going. I just keep going. I get, I, I didn't I get tired when I drive that far. <laughs> yes. And by the way, I didn't like running. Shortly after I got out of school, I quit. My friends were like, why don't you keep running? I said, because I hate it. I was good at it. I wanted to be doing something in sports and I sucked at golf and baseball and football and all that stuff. So um, perseverance is my second piece. The first one had to do with kind of asking questions and learning. And the second one had to do with um, uh, staying with it and not quitting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Those are like, I think those are like really awesome skills that I think everyone should have. And there are not a lot of talks about the, what it actually takes to become successful. There's a lot of, people showing that I'm a success. I can teach you if you pay me hundred dollars, but they're not actually foundational stuff, you know, that can help you become successful. Um, now coming to 2020, we're going to switch to a, a little bit different subject. Coming to 2020, um, there has been a lot of uh, people who have called the 2020 a year from the book of Jumanji, which is every month we have something new happening, like what is going to happen next? Um, now it, we have seen a lot of protests coming after, you know, the George Floyd incident. And everything happening now there has been sides saying oh there's too much protest there's too less protest or um but my question is this do you guys think the protests have been working or are there other things we should also be focusing on as we talk about this issue I, I gotta be honest man i i have a i have a tough i'll have a tough time answering that because mm -hmm. So we, our, our business, we went all virtual, uh, all online. And I'll be honest, man, like I've been out of the house since March about six times. Mm. And now that said, I can't fault any protester for doing anything they're doing. Like I, there's, there's, it, look, I'll be the first person to tell you, you sometimes you got to disrupt things. Sometimes you have to break things mm -hmm. to force yourself to have to build them back. Um, as far as like my, my accurate, like being involved, I have, I, I just have not really been around people a whole lot. Mm. And on some levels, just to be completely transparent, like I'm personally just questioning a lot of the information that I get. Mm -hmm. So I don't like, and that's not about, that has nothing to do with the, the BLM stuff or any of that. It has to do with COVID with all of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I, I'm a little, con I am admittedly a little confused <laughs> about the lens that I'm looking at certain parts of life at, because mm -hmm. I have been a little disconnected from it. Um, and so, but that said, you know, there's no, really no point in history where, uh, you know, okay, if you want to start a fire, you got to have some friction. And, mm -hmm. 
Um, so there's really, you know, that's the thing. And, it, it, and whether that's related to racial injustice or just look, I mean, if you're in the startup world, like I am, it's always a disrupt, 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 mm -hmm. you know? And so I think there has to be some level of disruption at, at the, on the flip side of that, I, I'm not a big fan of the destruction of things mm -hmm. in general. Um, for the purpose of making a point and let now sure tear down the confederate general statues i'm cool with that but on some of it i you know i i i think that you can make some points without getting violent like mm -hmm. that because you just end up having to rebuild things um i think sometimes people get it, it's whether it's it, those protesters or someone else it's like you know, like don't tear up your own community, but at the same time, I think you can be firm with that. So I, you know, in some places that went better than others. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I have no, I have no issue with any of that. I think it's uh, like I said, you can't start a fire without some friction. Yeah, Harry. Um, very fair. I, the, I think the simplest thing which you ended with is um, I'm a uh, huge supporter of the uh, protests and um, I don't like the riots. And I use those words yeah, specifically because yeah, yeah. I think of rioting as looting and um, that, that serves no purpose. I, I'm guessing that a lot of those people are not really involved with the cause at all. They're using that as an opportunity to um, exploit the system, which is unfortunate. I don't know it, but I would guess. Um, I've taken this opportunity to try to learn. Um, I, uh, I have a peer group. It's similar to Vistage, but um, it's called the Heartland uh, Business Exchange. And Sly James recently joined our group and started coming uh, a few months ago. And it's been extraordinary listening to him and his perspective, uh, having been the mayor of Kansas City for two terms and um, doing the work that he's doing now. So he's helping me. He's also giving us suggestions about books. I've, I, I've read White Fragility because he specifically um, suggested we do that to try to learn. Um, I, I think more than anything, one of the simplest things I would say is um, Colin Kaepernick uh, got a raw deal. Um, he did exactly what people would say you should do is um, peacefully protest and make a point. His point was, uh, had to do with um, police injustice and brutality. I don't know his specific words. It was something like that. And it got twisted into him being some sort of unpatriotic, non-flag loving guy. Mm -hmm. That wasn't what he was doing. And um, I'm looking at this thing. Uh, we, we've got a long way to go to figure these things out because um, I think the divisive nature of the United States is going to make it harder because Portland is going to become Chicago and might become um, Albuquerque or wherever next. So I want no looting, but I love the protests as long as it's done. Um, that's very American. That's the way you get stuff done a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, you know, uh, what Matt was saying, the protests are needed, right? Um, when it comes to the looting, like Harry said, there's some parties that are not even part of the movement that has been using this as an advantage to do what they need to do. Now the question, it, it goes to, uh, when it comes to Kaepernick, you know, uh, peaceful protests or protests that makes a loud noise is <laughs> which one should we be doing? Or which one should we do? Because at, at the end of the day, I think both are needed. You know, a protest that makes a lot of noise and a protest that says it's peaceful. Because if you trace back to the, even the, the Tea Party, you know, that was a protest that happened when I think that was when they, they threw the, the, the tea uh, from, from, the, from the boat into the water. So at, at, from time to time, there's always been a, a, a mix of disruption to change things that are not working, to make you know, all the decisions to progress things. So I think one important thing that this has helped so far is bring up conversations about equity, bring up conversations about diversity, because a lot of companies have been talking about it, but have not been doing it. Now, um, I think it's important to have those protests and have people speak out their mind because it, it brings up a lot of questions and people to learn. Because for me personally, I've been learning, I've been soaking information, I've been interviewing people, asking questions um, to learn more about it. Because I don't know too much about it, but um, I have had some experiences. But then there are too many details and history into it that everyone needs to learn. I think the most important thing I've heard from all my conversations is there's a lot of people talking, but there's a few people listening. Because everyone comes to the table saying, hey, I have this perspective and my perspective is right and it's better than your perspective, so you need to listen to me. Where there are no many people saying, oh, I'm coming in open-minded. I want to learn from you. It's not really, I don't want to prove you wrong or prove you right. It's me saying, I want to learn and let's talk about things and how we can improve. Now, on the other hand of things, on the more action things, um, there's been a lot of talk about equity in, in, in the workforce. 
how how important is equity to you guys given you guys are leaders in different workforce you mean how, how important is it to have diversity within diversity your workforce in, in your organization sure. do you that i i it blows my mind that that we that people don't have as much of it as they do um you know i i think and it's been a, a hot topic we've had i was actually talking to roy scott from healthy hip-hop about that because it, it, it's it's a challenge sometimes like and and so let's be realistic sometimes it's a demographic challenge so here in kansas um it's it's a di it's sometimes you know it's difficult there one of the things that comes up with the diversity is well there aren't as many women in tech there aren't as many founders and stuff like that so you know sometimes it can be a challenge to bring certain folks in now today we announced that we had hired uh, jessica powell from uh, many people know her locally, and she's joined uh, Full Scale as uh, her. She's our new director of strategic uh, partnerships, and we brought her in specifically to try to connect us to to have someone in charge of of creating partnerships and relationships with a, a wide swath of different stuff. You know, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's important. Um, but but I mean, I will say that sometimes it's a challenge because in certain in certain categories, it, you don't end up with a large pool of people to talk about. And as a business owner, you want to hire the people that are the best fit for everything that you do. And you're kind of intuitively trained over the years to choose from the, the largest number of people possible. Like you don't interview one person for the job, you talk to a bunch of different people. So, mm -hmm. and, and that's where it does just get a little challenging because you know, it just like, like I said, it's, it, it is sometimes difficult, but I think it's important that the difficult part is just finding the, the, the increasing the sample size of people mm -hmm. that you would talk to. So, but I mean, we always make an effort to go out and, and, and do that and look at that and do a number of different stuff. Now, one place where we've actually been able to do a great job with that is in our office in Cebu City in the Philippines. And we are very, very proud of the fact that 21% of our tech, our tech uh, services providers are female. Mm. Um, if you had to find, there's no company with more than 10 people in the US that does tech that can say that. And now we didn't even realize that was the case until we added up the numbers. So I think if you're doing a good job with diversity, you might not even know that you have done a good job with diversity, meaning like you shouldn't be paying attention to that. Um, I also recently didn't realize until I had never thought about it. I had literally made a million dollars in investment commitments before we realized that half of it was to minority owned businesses or female founders. And I think that's kind of, kind of the point. Like yeah. if you're, I think if you're doing some of the right things, then it shouldn't have to be something you review. Mm -hmm. um, now that wasn't intentional. Like, and honest, I gotta be, I really had not even done the math or considered that until recently. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, like, I don't know, I just think it's something that people should be paying yeah. attention to. And at, while at the same time, you got to make the best decisions that are related to your business and mm -hmm. the people that work there. So, yeah. yeah. Harry. Sure. Um, I, can't imagine why you wouldn't want a diverse group, whether it's a leadership team, uh, organization. No. I, I can't imagine it because if, if your goal is to um, create a thriving enterprise, there's a much higher chance of making a mistake if you have same thinking. And you could be same True. thinking uh, socioeconomically, um, race, religion, in any of these things. And if they matter, they matter. And you get people with different experiences, people that have failed, people that have won, people that have learned, and people that have different contacts with other people. If you want to win, I, I literally cannot imagine why you would not think a broader spectrum of points of view and background is better. Mm -hmm. I, it just, it's beyond me. Mm -hmm. it, you're, I, I think you're being not just insular, but I think there's a bit of fear involved there if you're not willing to have um, people that uh, don't look exactly like you on your board or in your leadership team. I think it's just wrong. Yeah, yeah. I think I, they always say that a diverse group is always more successful than a group that's not diverse. So I think diversity is key. It, it teaches everyone different things about different people and you learn from each other. Um, now I want to ask this from a self, from my selfish point. Um, will you guys in the future be willing to come to UMKC to speak to our students at some point in the future if we were to invite you guys. Just tell me when. Great. Yeah. 
Easy. I'm uh, I'm not open till three o'clock this afternoon, but after that, I'm open. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, because I would love to have you guys on campus again. Like, like I said, <laughs> passing down that wisdom, uh, passing down that knowledge. Actually, I'd like to revise my offer so I can be competitive with Harry's <laughs> expert response. I will only do it if you let me bring one of the people that I find to be the most successful entrepreneurs. I don't even know who that'll be yet, but okay. I, I'm, I got to come in a pair. Or okay. it, we're, that, we, we have to have like offer double the value. Yeah, and I'm I'm not coming unless I can get two diet cokes and be a co-host with Matt because um, I just listen ah. to what he says and just think, oh, this is beautiful. I got this. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. hum that's humbling. That's then humbling. we have a panel. Then we're gonna have a panel discussion, which is even even way better. So um, that would be awesome. Now we've come to the end of the show. I want to ask one last question. Um, what are two takeaways you want anyone watching this in the future to take from this conversation? To you that you want to give someone out there to hold on to this is what i want you to actually take from today i i think that if don't be afraid to get started on your big vision mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like the right time's never coming i say sometimes you have to jump and then build wings mm -hmm. um because nothing will make you build those wings faster than knowing that the canyon floor is coming soon yeah. Um, and another thing too is like, I mean, just really like it, it's still in that same regard. Like, what chase your chase what you're passionate about. Um, if what you're doing right now is not what you're passionate about, quit, freaking quit, and go do whatever you're as passionate about. Because so 15 years, man, I'm getting old. 20 years ago, <laughs> my first wife, and I've had two wives named Jill. So oh, Jill wow. number one thought I wor was working too much and she wanted me to find a hobby. And I tried a whole lot of uh, stuff and I really realized that I really like making money. So I decided that making money was gonna be my hobby and I legitimately have not worked a single day since. Mm. And that's case in point, like do what you're passionate about. It won't feel, and believe that that, it, that has now become your hobby and your outlook on life will change. Like. I, you know, people are like, dude, do you work a lot? I'm like, no, nah, man, I haven't worked in 20 years. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm doing what I love. Like, the, like work would have to be going to work for Harry at some other company or <laughs> anyone. Like, I, I, I'm living my dream and I feel great about it. So it helps you get through the times that suck, especially when life deals you what you might think is a crooked hand to, mm. to go with, with Harry's lingo there. Because nothing's going to get you through the low points more than just knowing that you're doing what you're passionate about. So find it, do it. Let's go. I, I, I just had a discussion with my publisher who happens to be talking right now and um, realized that the best way to answer this is to go back to my book because I really mean it. The three takeaways I have, it, it, I was going to try to pull some different words out and mm -hmm. kind of massage it around, but I won't do that. I'll just say, Think about being an attractor. Be somebody that people want to be around. They want to listen to you. They, they, they want to um, emulate you. Uh, they want to give back to you. Be an attractor. Um, think about the crookedness of life, uh, about what's going to happen because things go, could go wrong four minutes after this call is over and how you react to it is important. And the third one is learn, live to learn. Uh, ask questions. Um, ask someone to be your mentor. Uh, learn, learn your competitors. Um, ask your clients what they need and what they want. It, just learning is so fun mm. that it, and it also leads to success. Yeah, yeah, man. Awesome, great advice. Um, we'll come to the end of the show. How can people reach out to you guys if they want to get in touch with any of you uh, to ask for anything? My, my email is deco, D-E-C-O at fullscale.io. You can become friends with me on Facebook or LinkedIn. I pride myself on being open and accessible. I'm not going to promise you my responses will be th as fast as you might hope, but I will reply. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot of ways to find me. Uh, and if you want to just, if you really just want to punish yourself uh, listen and hear me talk, that I publish about five podcasts a week. So Startup Hustle is, is something that I have, am passionate about, and uh, that's a good way to get to know me. Awesome. Um, the, the simplest way to get me is to go to my website. It, it's for my speaking business. It's harryscampbell.com. Um, I'm also on social media. I'm very findable. I've got a, a business page for Facebook and a personal page. 
I've got a couple Twitter accounts, one that's personal, one that's business, but you know what? I mingle all those. It, it just gives me a chance to do a little bit different in them, but um, I'm uh, Harry S. Campbell at gmail.com and um, I love to engage. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming on the show today. It, it's been an awesome time. It's been a great um, inspiration and motivational time with you guys today. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank Peace. you for eating. Um, I hope to see you guys after this whole COVID thing is over and get to work with you guys more. So um, stay safe, stay fired up, and uh, keep doing what you do. Hey, Matt, give me a Ric Flair to sign off here, baby.